Good afternoon. Let me start my presentation. As introduced, my name is Jung uh, Su Yang, and I worked in the U.S. for about six years. I work for the CRO company, GLP and uh, GMP compliant organization. Well, I had an experience of communicating with the uh, FDA. So I want to share my experience today in applying uh, ICH M10 guideline. In the U.S., there are many CROs and they have their SOPs. And when we look at the SOPs, my oral CRO organization and other uh, CRO organizations are also the same. They do have their SOPs. And they base their SOP on FDA guidance and also ICH M10 guideline. So the goal of this presentation is to uh, talk about the analytical report and understanding the significance of the report. There are four documents that are submitted to the FDA, analytical report, validation report, and also the protocol for each report. For FDA, my experience tells me that these four documents from one page to till the last page, actually FDA reviewers do not go through every pages. What they see first is the analytical report. And in the analytical reports, FDA officials look at the internal standard. What is the internal standard used? And secondly, they look at uh, start to look, read from the back of the report, meaning ISR, the repeatability, and the ISR table is reviewed first, and then run summary is also reviewed. For example, out of 10 samples, how many samples or how many runs were done. And for each run, all runs passed or if there is any fail. And then is there any reanalysis? If there is no reanalysis, then that is good. But if there is cases where the reanalysis was conducted, and if the number, that number is high, then it's suspected. So the good analytical reports simply put is the thicker uh, the thinner one because all the runs are passed and the internal reference is good and there is no reanalysis if that is the case the analytical report would be thin and after the analytical report review the FD officials go, go to the validation report so today I want to talk about accuracy and QC samples The control sample is used to assess accuracy and calibration standard curve is not used for the assessment of accuracy. And also for the internal standard, how we design the internal standard and how we apply the internal standard to the analysis is important. Actually, that affects the reliability of the bioanalytical method. That's a game changer, actually. And also calibration standard curve. I will talk about it. 
And maybe you believe that I need to talk about the calibration standard curve first before the internal standard. However, the reason that I talk about is that when we compare standard curve and the QC, uh, QC curve, actually QC curve is more important, quality control is more important, and calibration standard curve is uh, secondary important. And there is a development and validation. So for the development, It's almost a full validation. The validation report, if it's thin, that's better. All the validation items are all done. In other words, the full validation. Fully validated method need to be used to assess the samples. And in the validation report, describe the issues and errors. But if there is anything like that, and that will attract uh, not good attention. And for each validation item, and actually we need to be able to predict what kind of the outcomes will come out from the validation items. So in order to do that, we also uh, we first do the development of the assay. So the potential issues need to be confirmed during the assay development. And if the issue is confirmed to be likely to occur, then the solution need to be found out. So if that is the course of the action, then the del rather than the validation, but the assay development will uh, require more time and efforts, and the development binder will be uh, separately created. The FDA sometimes require development binder and the data and the content in the development binder, binder can also be uh, reviewed and acknowledged by the FDA. And sample analysis uh, will be the last topic that I will cover. So for the sample analysis and the validation, if I compare these two, then the sample analysis is more important than validation. So when it comes to analysis, actually accuracy is important, the most important factor. So how can we assess accuracy? Percent bias. So for the percent bias, in order to calculate it, we need to have two things. For the quantitative uh, analysis, then we need to have a calculated concentration data and also expected or nominal or theoretical concentration is also required as an information. For the qualitative uh, analysis, it would be mass and the unit would be Dalton. So expected concentration is needed so from the unknown sample, the expected concentration cannot be identified or guessed. So in order to assess accuracy, expected concentration, the QC sample with the expected concentration can be used to assess accuracy. So if we assess accuracy with QC, and that method actually deliver accuracy, then the unknown sample, the actual samples can be applied with that method, and the calculated concentration from that unknown sample can be relied upon. That's the logic. So for QC, you can see the question on the slide. When I made job application to different companies in the US, there was a common question asked. That was, so doing the validation and the sample analysis, 
So if the validation result is so good, no error, no fail during the process, accuracy, precision, stability, lot to lot the uh, validation, everything is perfect. But and then, with that validated method, you conducted sample analysis. There was no fail or QC meets acceptance criteria and ISR should be perfect. Until the last run, there was no issue, but ISR actually failed. I think you might have the same experience. In that situation, what would be the reason uh, for the fail of ISR? That was the question asked many times. Well, I can uh, explain about it with this slide. So basically, the actual samples and the surrogate of them are the QC samples. And the QC samples and the real study samples should be identical. However, that's not possible. But still, they resemble, the QC need to resemble the real study samples and they should be stored, they should be treated, and they should be analyzed, analyzed with instrument. However, for QC sample and the real study sample, if there are major differences between them, then until the analytical runs, no issues were found, but at the ISR, there can be a fail. For example, metabolite back conversion. In the real study sample, there should be metabolite. But in the QC, we didn't put the metabolite, only anabolite was inserted. But in the real study sample, metabolite back converted to the parent drug. And if that happens, the QC sample does not have the back conversion because there is no source. So the QC sample is very stable. However, the rear sample during the storage uh, and also during the pre-treatment and even in the processed sample, the back conversion may occur. And if that happens, then depending on the amount or the extent of the uh, back conversion, ISR percentage difference, it can be like 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%. So the variation would be very uh, large. If that is the case, ISR will fail. And secondly, you can think about pro-drug conversion. In the rear sample, there is pro-drug remaining, but in the QC sample, we have only analyte. However, there is a product uh, conversion occurring in the rear sample, then of course ISR will fail. Encapsulated analyte. In rear study sample, uh, the analyze are encapsulated, but in the QC sample, it was not encapsulated analyte, it was just analyte. So there is a difference between QC sample and the rear samples. So ISR will fail. And the concentration that we want to report from the study samples uh, cannot be trusted. An interfering substance can be another example. In the QC sample, Grammatographic interference, mass factory interference, processing interferences can uh, exist. So the rear sample can have them, but in the QC sample, they don't. For example, in the non clinical study, Rat or mouse, who are small animals, when the uh, administration is done through the IV, 
So the drug is administered directly to the vessel, blood vessel, but there is a co-solvent effect. So in the rear sample, co-solvent dilute matrix, a chemical matrix exists. So pretreatment or at the LC level, mass factor uh, level, the interference uh, effect can occur. However, without them in the QC, the accuracy is well secured with the QC samples. However, with the actual sample, the real samples, overestimation or underestimation can occur with the concentration data. And in the real uh, sample, analyte is the protein, but in the QC, we have peptide. So in treating digestion as a part of the pretreatment can be done. So it's a protein, but in the QC, uh, treated peptide is inserted. And then the QC samples accuracy would be good. But triptych digestion, enzymatic reaction efficiency, and its validation, if it's not done, then in the real sample, that part is not controlled, and therefore the data from the real sample cannot be trusted. For the chemical product, it's a chemical uh, derivatization. And excessive analyte solution in QC, that in the blank matrix, analyte solution is spiked. If the volume is too much, then the volume itself is different from the real sample volume. Then in the efficiency of the uh, pretreatment can be different for the QC sample and the real sample. And that affects the reliability of concentration data. So for QC, what we need to do is they need to be stored, thawed, and pretreated for the samples, and then analyzed with the instruments. But in the same time, it should be done alongside with the rear study samples. In other words, a step-by-step -step parallelism. ICH guideline also talks about the bracket for QC sample should bracket the real sample. It, what it means is that it should be done alongside with the real sample and also If you think about the plasma long-term stability study, QC sample, the long-term stability duration of that QC sample should cover the real study sample. In other words, storage in the storage condition, QC sample need to bracket the real study sample. And in doing the pretreatment for the samples, the often taking place mistake is that the QC samples are all pretreated and then go for the rear sample or vice versa rather than doing them together. So that's what bracket is. I mean, if you are bracketing it, one set of the QC samples need to be pretreated and then rear sample, the one side of the rear samples need to be uh, pretreated. And afterwards, the QC sample need to be treated again so that it should be bracketing it. It's not like an MCRS uh, treatment. And FDA guidance especially talks about 
the standard curve. It's not a standard curve. The QC samples are the surrogate of the real study samples. And therefore, the QC concentration range, the QC is not the standard curve. The QC sample need to cover the concentration of the real study uh, samples. So, for example, at a OQ, your OQ, 1 to 1,000, that's a real study sample. The QC, it's from 3 to 8 fold. What it means is that the QC sample from the lowest run which is the concentration, the lowest concentration is a 3 and the highest concentration is 800. And then within that range of 3 and 800, that range should cover the real study sample concentration range in accordance with the FDA guidance. So that should be uh, the one that you need to pay attention. And lastly, there's the matrix matching issue. Between QC sample and the real uh, sample, uh, there has to be a matrix matching, and that could be a potentially important issue. Here I have uh, written down uh, or given example of stabilizers, uh, stabilizers or absorption inhibitors. And uh, sometimes between a QC uh, sample and the real samples, there was no matrix matching done between stabilizers or the absorption uh, inhibitors. If there is no matching is done, uh, despite you know no matching in actual real samples, the uh, concentration data that I would like to see uh, uh, should be still be uh, you know trusted still be uh, credible and, and that has to be proven with tests and this could be included in the validation process or it could be uh, included in the uh, development process and that can lead to a conclusion and included in the development binder so if they accept that and uh, another important thing that is uh, that uh, companies sometimes miss is this the analyte stock solution or the analyte working uh, solution. And for the, uh, there are more issues with the biological of uh, for products than the chemical of the products, or there are uh, issues related to solutions. And for to prevent absorption, uh, to enhance uh, stabilizers, the uh, formigate is included in the solution. And so the working solution uh, would be uh, spiked in the blank of plasma, and that would be the QC sample. And so the formigate this is included in the QC sample. But in the real sample, it's not included. So there is a difference between uh, in terms of matrix. And that matrix difference in the will impact whether it impact uh, the uh, reliability or the confidence of the concentration of the real samples. And that is often missing. So that has to be uh, taken care of. And then there's some, uh, there are, uh, I want to talk about internal standards, which I think is a game um, changer. After analyte has been stored, thought, and uh, treated, and goes through the separation in the chromatography, and also uh, goes through the ionization and goes into uh, the mass spec, and it goes through the uh, the uh, the next step, and the variation of the analytes are bound to occur. It's unavoidable. I mean, there uh, there could be a you know a difference in terms of degree, but. Even if you put in the same thing, the variation will always be different. So this is unavoidable. And that uh, variation, or that is the peak area response of variation, 
uh, can only be captured with internal uh, standards. So when utilizing internal standards, the raw data would not be response. It would be response of ratio. So analyte response divided by internal standard response. We, you know, what would be uh, present delivered. So if the internal standards uh, follows or tracks uh, the uh, analog be variation has the you know, similar behavior per step, then uh, the ratio would be more consistent. And that is why. You know, the, so what sort of internal standards are used and how they are used and what in at what step they are applied or uh, sometimes determine a success. So I think there are three uh, different internal uh, standards. Uh, one uh, is stable isotope label, which is uh, SIL, or analog, which has this very similar structure to analytes. Or in uh, many cases, they use a compound with similar uh, chromatographic uh, behavior. So these three are used as internal standards. So in conclusion, stable isotope labeled standard is the best option. And uh, so this is something that FDA pays special attention to. So what sort of uh, internal standard is used? If the analog is used or a compound with similar uh, chromatographic behavior is used, then uh, the reported concentration, well, uh, there could be a reliability uh, variation and therefore, uh, there will be uh, less uh, credibility. So that's what the FDA reviewer will be thinking. And then I want to talk about the calibration standard curve uh, construction. There are two types of calibration curves. One is a linear uh, regression curve, and the, the other is the uh, is the uh, uh, nonlinear uh, regression. So a calibration standard curve construction, what does that mean? So that means you decide what's A and what's B. So these are unknown value. So in order to decide on A and B, you need two types of data at least. In case of linear regression, in order to make the curve, you need two different calibration standards and, and get the data from that, those. And, but they believe that two is not enough. Three uh, would be able to provide weights, different weights. And so if you uh, uh, multiply two to these three, that's A, B, and, and C. So according to the FDA guidance, if for the uh, uh, linear regression, we are forming and the calibration curve, at least there has to be uh, six different concentration level to construct the, the curve to decide on A and B as well as weighting, which would be C. As for the quadratic, they, you need three plus one, so there will be uh, so that you would uh, multiply by two. So in case of quadratic, there would be at least uh, eight different concentration levels to uh, construct one curve. And linear regression would be the best option. And FDA, of course, accept a quadratic, which is non-linear uh, regression. But there is a precondition here. Uh, let me give you an example to explain this. Standard curve and QC, when uh, make them, you have to make a stock solution, and then you get the serial evaluation and come up uh, with the working solution. Uh, 
and the consonants and uh, so you have the blank uh, blank uh, plasma for the uh, working uh, solutions then you would have a uh, qc with different concentration level and then the curve uh, would be uh, the quadratic would be more curved and the qc accuracy is quite good and the amp so intraday or intraday is you know, is all in terms of intraday intraday AMP is perfect, and the quadratic you would have more uh, concentration points. So AMP is uh, fully compliant. So would that be the end of it? And that is not enough. For instance, so. So if you don't make a standard curve or this uh, the QC curve that way. So if you have a stock solution and then you do a blank a plasma spiking and then you have the serial uh, dilution for QC. When you do that, uh, the QC is not aligned. But if you do the serial dilution with the blank a plasma, you could give that as QC. Or so so we can decide you know what we're going to do in terms of the data processing so qc would not be just qc they will be set as a curve then it will be a direct line in uh, for the qc samples if that can be confirmed what would that mean so the cause for the qu uh, quadratic so from the uh, mess spec ms and the quadratic was not uh, created during the pre-treatment process when creating working solution and also uh, during the uh, stock solutions in that you know process in creating those solutions there there are causes uh, for the quadratic are generated there and so that uh, cause has to be handled that must be handled and about uh, assay development and assay uh, validation and assay development for the validation uh, uh, when encountering issues it would take a lot of time so that you would really need a uh, patience so in the development process if you can find the answers even if you have a uh, problems with the validation you'll be able to uh, you know, deal with those issues and and you would know what sort of answers you're beginning from the validation process and when you know all these things and then begin to do the validation you can finish it within a week's period and the validation report will be quite thin because you could just you know one line per item and so it, you would create a validation report so that is the kind of a validation report that uh, would be that should be submitted uh, for success and so so you have to look at the stability first and one of the things that the companies miss is this uh, when you do the plasma analysis you cannot get it a uh, plasma from the body directly uh, they, you have to draw the blood, blood first, and then you have to get the plasma. So, in terms of, so if you don't get the blood stability first, uh, you would not be able to get the plasma that you want. Uh, there could be a very quick uh, degradation that occur in blood, and there will be less than you know ten percent plasma remaining. And uh, so if you, you know, think about, you know, stabilizing plasma, you know, it doesn't really mean much because you only get your 10% of plasma from the whole blood. And so pretreatment method or the AOC conditions or the ELISA conditions, if those conditions, even if those conditions are not, you know, uh, established, you can still get the stability and control test one and test two uh, can be utilized in order to uh, you can do the comparison to get the uh, to assess a stability and if the curve qc uh in the accuracy be quite good with that stability but if there's a, 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 a severe stability issue then the qc would not be aligned and 
for validation. I mean, there was no problem with the validation, but in uh, in uh, sample analysis, there could be a failed runs, and that is somehow related to batch sizes. I have not checked the stability enough, and I have not used a uh, method that is controlled. And so, uh, in the uh, validation process, the the batch sizes, it, uh, it, the more accurate uh, term would be a run size. And you would know the difference between the batch and run. And when you do the validation, the size would be uh, smaller. And when you do simple analysis, it would be a uh, bigger, and that would require more time. For if there is a bracketing, then the QC might not uh, be in line with it. <coughs> But without the bracketing, the runs for the real samples may fail because the runs uh, are uh, assessed based on the QC sample, whether the QC samples actually uh, meet the acceptance criteria or not. But at the end of the day, uh, ISR will have <coughs> some issue. For the stability, I, as I said, the stability is the very first thing that you have to look at. And once the stability is secured, and with the conditions that you can, uh, uh, you believe that you're under control, then uh, you can go for the next step. So that's the right procedure or uh, the steps. For the goal of the validation, at the end of the day, the validation is to do the simple analysis. The validation for the sake of the validation of the say is not the right way to go. If we just design the uh, validation for the validation itself, it will uh, make challenges in the sample analysis. So validation failure is not a big issue, but for the real samples, you may have to do the animal study again or the clinical study again in an extreme case. For the validation items, there are the essential parameters, accuracy of course, that's an essential validation parameter, and precision of course. Yes, it is accurate, but it's only one time. If that is the case, then that's an issue. So the, it should be accurate all the time, like morning, afternoon, and evening, today, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow. So like between day, not just one sample, but with other sample, the accuracy should be secure. That's what the between day accuracy precision means. So that's all about the precision. And of course, sensitivity, signal to noise, well, FDA does not are not very much interested in that. LLOQ calibration standard is not the one they are interested in. LLOQ standard, LLOQ standard between day, within day, accuracy, precision need to be meeting the criteria. And carry over, of course. That's an essential parameter. Because in the real sample, it's not just a one sample and all. At least the two samples and the sequence of the samples will be treated, and LCMS instrument analysis will be instrumental analysis will be conducted, and therefore the carryover is critical and essential parameter. Of course, lot to lot variation. For example, ligand binding us say at least ten lots. CC, at least six individual lots will be used for the lot to lot variation checking for one subject or the sample from one subject. It's not something that we analyze. We usually at least go for two, more than two subjects. 
the plaza samples are taken from two different individuals. And therefore, lot to lot uh, variation is a very critical per, uh, parameter. Hemolysis, epidemia, and specificity, maybe they're not the essential parameters in this case. Hemolysis uh, may not be there in the rear sample. If that is the case, there is no need to evaluate hemolysis and lip lipemia specificity in the curious sample. So the same is true for the hemolysis, uh, lipemia, uh, lipemia, and specificity. And for the uh, plasma stability, long term phase, thought cycle, short term, are all essential parameters. Without the assessment of the long term stability, then it means that you're not going to uh, analyze the samples that are being stored for long term. And free thought cycle is also important and short term is also important too. So blood is taken and then just to do the pretreatment right away and then generate data. It's not what happens. It's not feasible. And therefore, these uh, long-term, short-term, flea cell cycle are very important essential parameters. And um, urine, for example, the collection stability, sometimes there can be absorption and it will uh, lead to loss. So it should be checked and solution stability. Internal standard working solution short-term stability is a must. Then you might be wondering, Analyze stock solution, working solution, are they a must or not? In most of the cases, uh, they should be done. For example, the powder is weighed. Then they are not made into the solution right away. The powder were put into the blank plasma. So stock solution, working solution are not prepared. If that is the case, there is no need to check uh, the solution stability as a part of the essential parameter. However, this is not happening that much. And what about the recovery? Recovery is essential or not? Most of the cases, it's not essential. And ICH guidelines actually says so. From the FDA guidance, it seems to be essential. However, when we submit data to FDA, the recovery, although there is a no recovery data, it doesn't cause an issue. QC sample and the rear sample, it, let's say the recovery from the uh, re rear sample is only 20%, but still the QC sample also has 20%. Uh, then the QC sample, if the uh, concentration is 100, it will report as such. So when recovery becomes essential, you need to think about the processing efficiency. So recovery should be seen as a broad concept. Extraction efficiency, reaction efficiency, and filtering efficiency, and others. If you think about them in the real sample, and unlike the real sample, the QC sample, we assume the recovery to be 100. And if that is the case, and if that is only design that you can apply, and it's the best design you can apply, then the efficiency, which is actually the recovery in the wide sense, need to be assessed. So if the recovery is 50% here, then the rear sample, the concentration from the uh, rear sample need to be corrected with the uh, recovery uh, of the 50%. low concentration, medium concentration, high concentration, low high, for example, a stability, lot to lot variation, low high. But for the recovery, low, medium, high concentration are used for the recovery uh, assessment. There is a reason for that. For the recovery, if you want to calculate the uh, mean value, then if you have uh, only have two values only, but there is an SD issue. In order to uh, 
in order for the SD to be meaningful statistically, you need to have at least the three values. If the FSD is divided by the mean, then you will have CV. So the mean with the two values cannot be trusted. So CV should be between uh, 0.5 uh, to 15. So for the recovery, sometimes it's essential. In that case, at least the three different concentration level need to be used for the recovery assessment in order to have the mean recovery value. So that kind of the data is needed when the recovery evaluation or the recovery is essential parameter. And what you see on the screen is really important message. Most of the uh, SOPs actually state this. A trend should be demonstrated to be unstable. So in order to say the trend to be unstable, it means that you should demonstrate the trend first. And actually, if you think about in the past, for example, long-term stability for a year. So long-term stability here, the tested samples are the, uh, the samples uh, stored for an year, and we have the curve, uh, curve calculated based on the concentration. And then the bias is calculated from the concentration, which is plus minus 15%, then you can uh, determine that to be stable. Or if it's outside of the range, then it would be unstable. But here, you just cannot say it because you need to look at the trend. Although it is above or lower than 15%, like the minus 20%, which means the degradation, but you need to look at the trend day zero and test one at month six and test two at one year. So you have to have a trend to determine whether it is unstable or not. So determination should consider the trend. The full validation and partial validation for that. For the full validation, of course, the fully validated method need to be applied to the rear uh, samples. When I say full, i not talking about all the items, all the parameters. Here, what it means is that trusted reliable parameters, all the parameters that are needed to have the reliable data or the conclusion on the concentration. That is what all essential parameters, not all the parameters. For partial validation, we need to think about post-full. So there was no full validation so you say there is no full validation and there is no full validation needed. Then I can go for partial validation. No, it's not the case. That's not what partial validation is about. When you have a communication with the FDA, if you stick to that concept of the partial validation, you will be in trouble. So when it comes to the partial validation, you should assume that there is a full validation method already. And for some reason, for some changes, because of the some changes, you are doing additional validation. That's what partial validation is about. And that's uh, really important when you communicate with the FDA. And when personnel change and the validation is already done in like a one year ago. And now we are applying the same validated method. But that does not mean that we have to do another validation. So the personnel changes and the run fails. Then that's an issue of the personnel, not the method. So it's not a validation issue. The same is true for the time gap. 
It's not about the validation. It's a test or the verification. Oh, now let's look at sample analysis. Here I'm only going to talk about reanalysis. Uh, my experience in the U.S. tells me that less reanalysis, the better. If you don't have reanalysis table, and if the text says there was very little uh, reanalysis is done, oh, well, that would be the best case uh, scenario. But if reanalysis is done, well, it is actually strictly uh, prohibited. I mean, there are you know very strict uh, limitation put on the reanalysis, and uh, reanalysis should be done only for clear errors, or preparation errors, or the pretreatment errors, or the instrumental errors, injection uh, errors, or the run failures, or the QC uh, sample has gone through, uh, has not passed uh, the allowable uh, limit, then it's a run of failure. So it's very clear. What does that mean? And that is before the reanalysis, the conclusion is already drawn. The original data would be thrown away. It means that it's not going to be included in the report. The original data is not going to be included in the report. On, so only uh, reassay data is going to be reported. So uh, that's what this means. If that's not the case, if I'm just uh, curious, I, mean, I have these questions. I want to do reanalysis. Well, that doesn't work. And from FD's perspective, that is not the right way to go. And about incurred a simple reanalysis. It's not simple a validation. It's it's uh, it's something that's uh, difficult to be translated into Korean. It's not uh, it's not a verification of the validation. It's more of looking at the repeatability. And the sample, uh, for the sample, you do not have like uh, the the correct answer. You just report that data, uh, the data you think uh, you can trust. And so, in the uh, the validated method has a repeatability. That's what it means here when we we talk about the ISR. And the ISR should be a single run. That's quite important. So that means that there should be only one ISR run instead of two or three. And so from one to three, you have like one uh, the sample analysis, and then you uh, uh, compare uh, the curve. That's what ISR means. And so the actual sample from um, first run until the tenth run, what's the most important one? And that is the consistency among these runs. And so if the consistency is uh, is guaranteed until the end, well, then you have, uh, uh, you know, what you're trying to see with the incurred sample reanalysis. And the, uh, the ISR curve should be a result of a single run unless you have a very unavoidable uh, situation. In the past, there was this question here in Korea. Uh, this was a question that was asked of me. And he said that the data is going to be submitted to FDA. And asked if the IS around QC do not meet the acceptance criteria, what happens? And the QC, you have the low, medium, high. And at the medium, uh, two of them have gone uh, beyond uh, the limit. So it has gone beyond the plus minus 15%. But that ISR, except for one, so it's almost 100%. The percent, uh, percentage of difference is within the allowable uh, limit. So it's almost perfect. And if you just look at the ISR difference, uh, the ISR re uh, reassay, you know, compared to the original, there was not much difference in the 100 samples, but the run itself has failed. And for that ISR, should there, there should be another run. And the answer, we no need for that. Think about the purpose of the ISR. And with the data of ISR, you do not need to make any description. It's a run. It's a run failure, but you could still say that with this ISR run, you still have been able to confirm a repeatability. And so, uh, 
is the last slide. Uh, development is about the pre-validation. And when you do the development, the first emphasis has to be given to the stability. If you have stability from the beginning, then the re remaining work is easier. And in the uh, validation step, you have to make sure that there are no errors so that the validation report would be quite simple and thin. And for each parameter, if you could have just one sentence, that would be the best case. And in terms of a simple analysis, I mean, in validation, there's no simple analysis. However, uh, the, the goal of the analysis here is to make sure that all the runs pass. So you want to be able to include a sentence that there has been no failure or with uh, so and so run was has failed. Well, that makes a big difference in terms of the quality, and the best uh, is uh, not to have any sort of reanalysis uh, table. And in the reanalysis section, uh, you should be able to say there was no reanalysis. That simple sentence uh, is quite important. And lastly, a criteria. must be based on scientific and justifiable judgment, especially uh, that's related to uh, a reanalysis. So that sort of a criteria uh, is quite important. Not If you are not going to receive any queries from the FDA, you have to make sure that the criteria is based on scientific and justifiable judgment. This is the end of my presentation, and I will take your questions.